All right, everybody, this is Chapter 3, the Atoms Building Blocks of Matter chapter. And this is really what I consider the first real aspects of chemistry, your first real taste into everything. Now, you've seen some of the things in this chapter before in previous classes, like in biology, stuff like that, but it's never really um, been flushed out the way that we're going to. So I'd like to do a little pretest when we're here. And at pretest, I just give you a piece of paper. If you want to participate at home, just push pause, get a piece of paper, and then uh, draw what you think an atom looks like from your other science classes. If you can label anything, try to draw it to scale, what's where, and all that kind of stuff. And hold on to it, because in a couple of videos, I'm going to ask you to take a look at that again. Again, in class, I'll collect it, and then I would uh, have you guys go out and um, actually uh, uh, do a post-test draft afterwards. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the philosophical idea of an atom and see how it evolved into the scientific theory that we have today. Now, atoms, we briefly talked about in other videos, they are synonyms for our elements. They're the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. Um, it comes from the Greek word atomos. Um, some American people uh, pronounce it at, um, atomos. It's not the same. You put the emphasis on the atomos. That means indivisible, which means it cannot be broken apart. And it's named after a Greek word because of this little Santa Claus looking fellow. Isn't he adorable? This is Democritus, who was a Greek philosopher in the fourth century, long, long time ago. I think it was like 340 something. And he was the first to suggest that there were atoms that existed and they made up everything in our universe. Basically, he said, like, if you have a piece of cheese and you keep slicing it in half and 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 in half, and in half you will get one atom of cheese. But obviously, we don't have cheese on the L on the periodic tables. He didn't know about compounds or anything like that yet. Um, but that is pretty much how it all came about. So when it comes to an atom, we have to talk about there's this huge gap from the year 340-ish to the 1700s where that's all that was known. And then in the 1700s, chemists were able to relate changes that they saw in the lab and in the environment to individual atoms. And they came up with the average size of an atom, which was 1 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams, and it had a diameter of 1 times 10 to the negative 8th centimeters. That's really, really, really small, okay? It'd be 100 million copper atoms that would end up taking uh, the width of 1 centimeter, which is pretty much that of your pinky finger. Isn't that a beautiful pinky finger there? Um, but atoms really do make up everything. We can trust them, even though the sign says not to. Um, and they're really, really small. And because of these numbers in scientific notation that we've gone over in other chapters and other playlists, um, it's a very difficult concept for us to wrap our head around and conceptualize. So you can click in my website to look at the cell uh, cell scale and it takes you down to the atomic level. It starts with a grain of rice and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then you can do the same thing with the size of the universe and there it goes into subatomic particles and it goes all the way subatomic particles and it goes all the way out to the size of different galaxies. Um, so it's a very interesting um, perspective to see those and kind of slide back and forth between the two um, extremes. All right, so how did all of this change in the 1700s? Well, this changed in the 1700s due to 
a scale, really. Um, the law of conservation of mass, which we've already gone over, where mass cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed, really showed that there was this bookkeeping. You know, if you had, um, you know, eight grams of element X and you had uh, four grams of element Y, when you reacted them together, you got 12 grams of product and you were able to track all of that. Okay, I always joke that back in the 90s when I was in high school, we had these huge TVs and my dad was real thin. And then later on, you know, a bunch of years later, we end up having really thin TVs and not so thin dads, you know. But well, total mass was conserved, right? <laughs> All right. Then we have um, two other laws. And they are the law of definite proportions and the law of multiple proportions. And they tend to get a little confusing. So let's flush out these definitions and examples. So the law of definite proportions says that a chemical compound contains the same elements in the exact same proportion by mass, regardless of the size of the sample. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you have an ice cube or, and I guess this would be better, an iceberg, okay? They're both made out of water. They're both made out of ice, okay? And the proportion of water is that there is 11.18% hydrogen always to 88.82% oxygen by mass. So they take a small section, a big section, doesn't matter. They can figure out that proportionally, it's always going to be the exact same. If it's not, then it, if not, then it is a different substance, okay? It's a different compound, all right? So if we have um, H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, and that's not going to be in the same proportions as water. Sodium chloride, our friend Knackel over here, is always going to be 39.94% sodium and 60.06% chlorine by mass. So it is a definite same proportion that does not leave. Okay? The law of multiple proportions says that you can have two or more compounds made up of the same two or more elements, but you will always see that there is a whole number ratio. Okay, so this is my famous example of CO and CO2 and why um, writing the names down properly and writing the formulas are so important. So CO is carbon monoxide, clear, odorless, poisonous gas. CO2 is carbon dioxide. Okay, both carbon oxygen compounds. Carbon dioxide is what we exhale, okay? It's clear, it's odorless, but it's not poisonous to us. Okay, the carbon monoxide is in a one-to-one -one ratio, whereas the carbon dioxide is in that one-to-two ratio, okay? So you can have multiple proportions with the exact same two elements, all right? H2O and H2O2, this is your water, this is peroxide. Okay, they're both made up of hydrogen and oxygen. One is a two to one ratio, the other is a two to two. Okay, so multiple proportions saying that you can have multiple compounds with the same elements. Okay, definite proportions are going to be, you know, looking at the definition, like a definitive amount for each one. Okay, so with all of those three laws, Dalton, John Dalton, known as the father of chemistry, was a British school teacher, and he proposed an explanation for those three laws. Okay, so here is John Dalton right here, and he came up with the atomic theory. It's named Dalton's atomic theory because, you know, his name and all that stuff. So it has five parts to it, five different aspects. Okay, so number one, Elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. So this was his shout out to Democritus. 
Okay, and he was like, all right, my man, I'm going to take care of you. You're the one that came up with it. This is for all for you. Okay, number two, atoms of the same element are identical. So it doesn't matter if you have copper over here in Saudi Arabia or if you have copper over here in Japan, they're going to be exactly the same in the same ways. They will have similar properties and they will differ from, I don't know, uh, lead in the exact same ways. All right, so that's number two. Number three is atoms of different elements can combine in whole number ratios, okay, to form compounds. So atoms are going to be like letters of the alphabet, okay? Compounds are going to be like words. So H2O is a whole number 2 to 1 ratio. Okay, sugar here, sucrose, C12H22O11. That is a 12 to 22 to 11 ratio. You won't ever see something like this. H2.503 quarters. Doesn't that even like look wrong? Like, eh, you can't have that. So you're only going to see whole numbers here. Why? Because they are indivisible. Remember, atomos? All right, so they're indivisible. So we won't be able to um, divide them up. Number four, chemical reactions are going to occur when they separate. So when a compound breaks up, this breaks up, or we join to make something like that, or if we rearrange, that's the law of conservation of matter. You can't change one into another. All right, and that is really important also because there's a lot of people that thought that they could take, you know, lead and change it to gold, and that's really dangerous from our fool's rush and all that okay and then lastly he said atoms cannot be subdivided there's nothing smaller than our atoms as hard as professor einstein tries he can't split an atom and he can't break them apart so you might already be thinking whoa 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 hold up i think that there's some differences here and the answer is yes. So we'll talk about that in the next video. Because remember, this is the 1700s. And that is a long, long time ago, my friends. And we have evolved in technology since then.